Hello everyone and welcome to the long-awaited Let's Edit. So here I'm going to go through, it's going to be quite a long video, so I'm going to go through my entire recording and editing process right from the hardware I use all the way through to the final product. So I'm going to break it down into sections and up on the screen now I'll put, um, in case people just want to kind of skip ahead, I will put the timestamps the various sections happen at. So those sections are my kind of hardware and physical setup, practicing and, well, planning out and kind of practicing a Let's Play, Recording and how to process the footage and get it ready for editing and the process of editing itself So without further ado sit back make yourself comfortable and I'm going to talk a little bit first about my actual physical setup So this is where the magic happens my kind of editing workstation So the main kind of brains behind the operation is this bad boy down here. So this is my computer Visible in the center is a GeForce GTX 770 graphics card, and then there's also up there leading to the front is a AMD FX8350 not quad octo core processor with a liquid cooler, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and hard drives with about 8 terabytes of storage space because, you know, video. Connected to that, is this whole nonsense. So at the bottom is a games console. Currently there's a Wii there, there's a Wii U somewhere else in the room, which is not currently wired up to this. But the Wii U is connected to this, the box of mysteries. So this is a capture card. Poke you in there. You can possibly see at the back, yes, there are component cables that connect that, five of them, YP, BPR, and two audio cables, which then go into that box and then back out of that box. The box does the recording for me. Orpage HD PVR 2, I want to say it's called. That signal then goes into this thing at the side. So this is a converter which allows the sig which converts the analog signal to a well the YPVPR signal to a VGA signal, which then connects to my second monitor up to the side there. That monitor is currently functioning as part of the computer, but will can become part of can become a TV when necessary, which is what that little box at the back does. You see that there, that's a VGA switcher going between my computer and the console. And then finally, well, I have this thing here. Well, actually to explain that, I need to explain this. So this is one of my microphones. This is a Rode M5. And it's, you notice there's one there. And there's another one over there. There's a red one and a blue one. And both of them, well, the blue one's on use at the moment, the red one is on this little boom arm that means it can move around into position for when I'm recording. Ow, trapped my thumb in it. Ugh, idiot. And that is connected to this thing, which is a Behringer Zenix Q820-802 USB. Yes, I just read that off, I don't actually know it. XLR port goes into there, this does a load of stuff, and then two things come out of it. USB port connected to the computer to allow me to um, record the signal on it. And it's also some nice power to the microphones. And then that cable at the back, that red one on the right, goes into this thing here. This is my other second little audio mixer. So this mixes together the sound from my microphone, so I can hear what I'm saying, plus left and right audio from the Box of Mysteries, with little mixy dials here, and all comes out to one mono signal there, which is what goes to my headphones when I'm recording. So... With all the hardware gathered, the next step for planning a Let's Play is to actually plan it out in terms of what order you're going to do everything in. And Metroid isn't the best example for it because I actually haven't got some of the stuff here with me, but what you first want to do is make a list of things. So the things in Metroid Prime are scans, upgrades, tanks, missiles, keys, beam ammo, power bombs, etc. Well, not etc. That's literally it. Following that, for each of the things, you can see at the bottom is how much, how many of each thing there are. I kind of use this to build the visualizer. From there, what I've got here is a kind of guide through the game in terms of which areas to go through. So areas in our areas are listed as just text without any um, coloring like that. Red is scans, and you can see kind of the color schemes according to that. For each thing, you need to make a list, which I no longer have because it's on another computer. Make a list of at what point in the game you get you can first access that thing then you make a list of kind of your order through the game and then you add the things in as you come to them so kind of you'll first just have a list of places then you add in the scans where you can first get them then here you add in like the items the energy tanks all that kind of thing and then slowly build up 
a path through the game. And that's a really, really important thing. If I show, for example, so this is for Mario Galaxy, which I'm currently planning. What we have here is a list of areas, galaxies within areas, missions within galaxies, and requirements for each one. Got a list of all of that. And then you can see from there, you then take those and assemble them into the order I intend to play through the game. And that's really crucial to do before really getting on and doing anything. This just demonstrates it a bit nicer than with Echoes, because I haven't got those data here. But I'll be talking about, about Echoes for the rest of this. Once you've got this assembled, the next step is practice. So for practice, you need two things. You need your list here that you can see on the left, and you need a stopwatch. Simple enough. And what you do is you just play through the game. So, say it's the beginning, you start. You hit start. Whenever you intend to be on camera, or whenever I intend to be on camera, I let this thing run. If I'm ever cutting or anything like that, or I think something's going to take a while so I'm likely to be off camera for it, I pause. And then you just keep playing until you either hit episode limit, which is more 20 minutes or something like that, or a kind of a good narrative point to end, which sometimes makes episodes shorter or longer. But this is for kind of keeping an eye on actually how something will split into episodes. While doing that, you make notes. So these are my notes for the first seven to eight episodes. As you can see, each of these, like, dotted lines here indicates the beginning of an episode with my kind of tentative episode name and I kind of have my own shorthand for this so generally each of these like a dash says go to a new room and then this tells me kind of what to do while I'm in the room um then I've got for example that means keep going until something like that so here I'd scan a light flyer and then proceed through what's obviously the straight path until I hit dark splinters or something like that um then I have this for example this little symbol either that uh, the kind of greater than followed by less than or without the dash in the middle that means cut to so i do whatever i do in agon temple then i cut to mining station a and you can see it again there so that should be cut to judgment pit proceed through the door straight ahead go to the portal chamber then proceed through to agon wastes and you can kind of see how i read all of this um and then i have another one which i guess i haven't got on here um which is i use a wibbly one um what's the actual signal that for go to a place that's in the dark world. I kind of develop my own one for each game as it's appropriate. But then when it actually comes to recording, this I will have up and this is what I'm actually glancing over at. I don't actually have a timer running when I'm recording because I trust to the fact that I've already, um, that I've already planned everything out sufficiently in terms of time. So I just do it. And the planning the time in advance just means I can relax. I don't have to keep starting and stopping a timer while I'm on recording. I can just be a bit more natural. And these things, I try to leave these notes as loose as possible. I, t I never include what to talk about in these notes, and I try to avoid including too much detail. It's more of just to remind myself what to do rather than as kind of actually a direct walkthrough for myself. It's just so I don't get hopelessly lost, really. Sometimes practice is just enough, but this is just to jog my memory because I'm old and my memory is not what it should be. So, next we can move on to recording itself, and recording requires two main programs, which I keep in my taskbar down here because I use them so much. Adobe Audition for audio, and Horpage Capture for video. Let's race them and see who fires up first. It's a win for Horpage, so... When this fires up fully, you will see I've got the Wii turned on at the moment, and indeed it's streaming in from the Wii, which is very nice. If I waggle the remote around, you can see it there. It's got a bit of a delay on it. You can't actually play on the screen, so there's about a two-second delay on it. Resolution, frame rate, all look good. So you just put in the file name as kind of blah, blah, something like that. I would then hit record when ready and you'd get something out. I will talk in just a second about what exactly you get out. Audio here is a bit easier. You just um, create an audio file. Blah, again, or, or not. I can't even spell blah. And then hit record. And as you can see, that's me talking. There we go. Wonderful. Once you've recorded... What you got to do then is, what, what I have to do, is process the footage also. You'll notice I'm recording in another program behind this, which is what I'm actually recording the commentary I'm currently saying with, which is extremely confusing, I know. So up next is a system, a series of kind of file processing things. So you've got two things to take care of. You've got compression and you've got interlacing. So I'll talk about these one at a time. So first off, interlacing. This... So, if I find up a nice example of the video we take... So, this is a nice bit of recorded Echoes footage, and it's a .ts file. It's a .ts file, which stands for Transport Stream. And by default, it is 
interlaced. And what does that mean? Notice whenever anything moves, do you see that it's kind of split into lines? Um, it kind of looks jagged around the edges. Like You can see that perfectly there. What that is, is interlacing. So, fancy graphic please, Doctor. What interlacing is, it was an old method of transmitting signals more effectively. You actually split the image into two. All the odd rows and all the even rows, and then you show one after another kind of alternating. And this is why old TVs will refer to, for example, 60 hertz mode, which is 60 of those sets of fields, A, then B, then A, then B, per, well, technically we're called top and bottom, per second. And the frame rate is half of whatever the field is, because each pair of fields, when they're shown, is fast enough that normally you, the idea is you don't perceive any any lines, you just perceive smooth motion. As you can see, it ain't that perfect, though. Um, so what you have to do is deinterlacing. And deinterlacing is a bit of a complex process, which takes place in a program called Avidamux. So here is our footage. The aspect ratio is slightly odd on it because of how it's encoded into the file. But we do a few things here. Um, we first off... Um, I'll just do some of this off screen. That's just loading up some kind of um, basics to make sure the bitrate and everything is fine. Then we kind of apply two filters to it. So the first thing we do is we need to deal with the interlacing, and so I use Yardif for that, which stands for yet another deinterlacing filter. Oh, stupid tech nerds and their jokes. And we use Bob, Temporal, and Spatial Check. So what does this mean? Let's have another fancy graphic. Obviously, when you're looking, when you're trying to fill in the blanks, so there's two ways of dealing with interlacing. You can either just combine the fields back together and just have whatever the original kind of frame rate um, was, but that doesn't look so good. Ideally, you'd like a kind of higher frame rate if you can do it. And you can kind of fake this because there is new information contained within each set of fields. So let's say you're trying to estimate what an, a mystery pixel should look like. This method not only checks all the pixels around it, but also this pixel in the previous field existed and in the next field existed. And you can basically average the pixels directly above and below it and the direct pixels directly before and after it and using those average out what it's going to look like. While we're in here we also transform it um, to basically get rid of that issue I was talking about with the um, aspect ratio being encoded into the file so we set it this is just I've worked this out entirely by trial and error from that pixel aspect ratio to that one and that sorts it out at least from there. So, this is our kind of footage beforehand, ends up looking like that. And if I then set it to play filtered, it ends up looking like that. So as you can see, the kind of, well that's a bad example because there are like, there are like fake interlaced lines in the game there. If I go to say this or something like that, you can see it plays nice and smoothly and there's no obvious sign of interlacing. And that's because the algorithm as it goes is basically making up half the data, um, but based on logical assumptions. So that's the first part of footage processing, which is deinterlacing. The next part is intraframe encoding. So this is to do with how footage is compressed. Um, and basically what we're doing in a way is kind of decompressing it. So video footage is compressed in both space and time. Space involves just standard graphics compression on a still image, and time involves, rather than encoding every image as a whole image, you encode it as changes since the last image. You set a keyframe, which is every however often, um, it's usually something like 70 something frames, I don't know what I actually have it set as, but you, every frame following a keyframe isn't actually all the information in, in that frame, it's just everything that's changed. I'll show a little kind of example of what that really looks like here, it means you can hugely save space in terms of the video file's ultimate size. Unfortunately, if you're doing something like editing, it's a real problem because it means to s load any given frame when you kind of jump to it out of order. Basically, it's designed for playing video in order. And if you jump to kind of a given frame out of order, there is then it first has to work out what frame you've jumped to, then work back to the last keyframe, and then work forward from the changes. And so it's a kind of three-step process to actually give you the frame you want. What we want to do is process it so that it's in through a codec where there is no time compression, where every every frame is its own frame of video, and that makes editing much, much faster. So we do that through Premiere Pro. So it's simple as we select our video file, go and export, 
And then, so usually my video is compressed with a H.264 encoder. Um, what we do for a proxy is, for a, for a kind of non-compressed proxy, is we use this DNX, um, DNX HD codec, which is compressed only within frames, not between frames. Advantage, makes editing super fast. Disadvantage, they are bloody gigantic. Because, so they'll be roughly, I think they're about 15 times larger than the file size. Well, we can work it out for this one. The, this first chunk that's kind of four hours long. The compressed video is about 16 gigabytes. The uncompressed is in the order of 190 gigabytes. So they're big. There's a reason I have an entire drive, a terabyte drive set aside just for editing proxies. Um, the reason I call them proxies is because the way you load them into Premiere Pro is you never actually edit on that file. It just uses the proxy file for quick display. And then it renders the kind of final version using... The full quality thing. I'll talk about that a bit more when I get into talking to editing, which will be in just a second. The final thing we do is audio processing. So that's again done in audition. So two things need to happen to the audio before it's usable. First off, it's a little bit quiet. Jump over it like that and everyone's fine. And so we need to amplify it. And the way I amplify it is using a tool called a hard limiter. This basically amplifies everything up to a point but won't amplify it past that point. At that point I set as minus 0.1, which means it's just below the point where it kind of goes and like unpleasantly blows out your speaker. So anything that's particularly loud will just be trimmed at the top so it's not unpleasant, but everything below that will be amplified by up to nine decibels. It applies quite quickly to an entire audio file. And as you can see, it's much louder and everything there's an example of when it actually kind of, so you can see here if I'm being particularly loud, it does clip off the top. It's these guys. The dark beam is powerful, and there that's just with the imitation of my voice where I go, the dark beam is powerful, but then sometimes it's when I'm properly screaming, like you can sometimes, let's see if we can find a great example of me being really loud. That looks loud. Irina, ow, oh, they can deal. <laughs> and stuff like that just doesn't sound as unpleasant as if it would had I just amplified it without using a hard limiter. Finally, you will notice if you listen to especially this bit here. Up they go. Right, so now you got three. There's a kind of whine in the background, and that's a combination of drive noises, electrical sound, that kind of thing. So we need to do noise reduction. Simple enough process. Select an area of noise, and with that you capture... Oh, bugger. Let's try that again. You capture what we call a noise print, so a sample of what the noise sounds like, and there it is represented spectrally. You then select the entire file and hit apply, and it removes those precise frequencies from everywhere on the file. And rather than wait for that to finish, I'm going to use an example I made earlier. Ta-da! As you can see in the bits of silence, now it's actually silent. And if you hear me talking, for doing a double jump, which is A, A, A. There's no noise in the background, which is wonderful. So now, let's get everything loaded into Premiere Pro and start our editing. So, with all that footage kind of recorded and processed in the right way, next up is Premiere Pro, my editing software. And you can see there's a hell of a lot going on here, which I'll kind of draw attention to stuff as it's necessary. I kind of have everything to the left here roughly sorted by kind of what it is. That wasn't the most obvious way of explaining that, but hey. First thing we need to do is we need to synchronize everything. Um, and we need to create a sequence uh, that we edit in. So we'll call this echoes main. And then drag your audio in. This is going to sound really weird because I'm talking to you, but as well, if I press play. Right, the audio rolling and beginning video in three, two, one, and start. So that's me from about three weeks ago. And as you can see, I give a timer of when I say three, two, one, start. And then afterwards, you'll notice this weird little kind of area here uh, of these bleeping sounds. That's what we call syncing. If I bring the video in, it will make a little bit more sense. So when do I start it? On and start. Somewhere around there-ish. So if we now mute my audio for a second and just play the video. So what you do for a sync really depends on what game you're playing, what console you're on, whether you're a PC, that kind of thing. But basically, the, the point of syncing is to have something, a sound, or something that you're doing, which picks up on both the microphone, like the, the commentary audio, and also on the game audio, and that allows you to synchronize them together. The Wii has a really nice one, if you increase and then decrease the volume of the Wii remote, that sound comes out of the speaker. And as you can see here, 
if you actually literally just look at the waveforms, you can line it up pretty nicely. The other way we tend to do this is on an Xbox, for example, you go onto the guide and you move up and down through menu options going as in you hear the click of actually I haven't got a games control to hand but you hear the click of the joystick and at the same time you synchronize that with the movement on the menus in the game so if I were to play this now oh nope still got myself muted and doctor syncing and death you're following on from that if you kind of unless something goes terribly wrong then you know everything's in sync. The beginning of this is all just um, the opening cutscene of Metroid Prime. You can see as well here, this is where the having the intro proxies really come into their own. For example, if I turn off the intro proxies, well, it's completely freaking out. There we go. So kind of this fast scanning doesn't really work. Um, whereas if you've got the proxies on, were totally worth it, um, even if they are gigantic. So. This whole beginning bit would be a cutscene. And I'm not really going to talk much about this because I've already edited this episode. I've actually edited it up to episode 6 at this point. And I'm, so what I'm going to do with you is episode 7. So let's delete all that work I just did. Because there's a hell of a lot going on here. This is episodes 1 to 8, uh, which I recorded in a single sitting previous to this. And I've edited kind of a lot of it. You can tell exactly where I've edited up to. So I just wanted to kind of show off syncing for now. This episode would start here. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, hear me. Bloody motion controls. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Metroid Prime 2. So this is then just how editing proceeds. I am going to, well, actually for now, I will just, obviously you don't want to watch through half an episode while I'm editing it. So I'm just going to edit the episode off camera. Well, I'll speed it up until I need to talk to you again. So a tiny little point here as well. This scene here, so I, I kind of, I scan this lock and then it does a brief kind of cinematic scene. During that time, if I play you just my commentary, What that clearly is, is me going for a drink, and no one wants to hear that whilst the game is in progress. So if I'm not saying anything, I tend to just cut out the silence there to make it just a bit of a cleaner recording. So now we come on to visualizer work. So here I'm scanning something I've never scanned for the first time. No, I've never scanned comma for the first time. Um, so I need to do the visualizer work. I like to do all of my visualizer work at the end of the episode, so I drop a little marker here. Noted appearing there. The marker is color coded according to what it is. Red for scans. And if I bring up my, where are they? Notes. So, as I showed you kind of earlier, these are the notes I used to practice with. Whenever I do anything on the visualizer, I also cross it off there. This way I can just kind of keep track of everything and it's handy for knowing if I've missed something. You can see the color scheme again, red for scans, blue for items, purple for dark temple keys, various other things. So I try and keep that same color scheme with my markers. But for now, I just put the markers there. Don't do anything else with them in the meantime. On with the show. Creature, which is... So now this is a nice little cutscene where we are getting the light beam. And because it's kind of an important cutscene, I like to turn the volume up. So by default, I have the volume turned down, as in the volume of the game, so that I can be heard over it. What I want to do is turn it up using keyframes. What are keyframes, you say? They are basically, they're ways of varying something over time. A keyframe basically says, at this point, be at this volume, or size, or shape, or color, or any effect like that in Premiere Pro, you can vary using, what are they called? Keyframes. So here, that keyframe is set to minus 12, and that one's set to 0. So it basically turns it down by 12, and then it's turned it up again. So it smooths nicely kind of like between them. Equally, when we get to the end of it, uh, well, we'll see how it sounds for now. Pins have been removed from the targets. As you can see, having it have to go for the keyframe rather than just being a state straight step up just means you don't notice a smooth, you don't notice a sudden jarring increase in volume so much. When we get to the end... And we have acquired the light beam. Yes, everything that's talking about dark and light energy is no surprise. 
So I'll have this one turned down a bit more quietly. Basically because I want the kind of to be at, at full volume. So let's hear that. And we have acquired the light beam. Yes, everything that's talking about dark and light energy is no surprise. The light beam. So, nice smooth volume transitions there. We also need as well, because this is an item, this means another marker for the visualizer. I kind of roughly try and standardize when I place them. This one's blue because it's an item, as you can see over here. Um, so usually like for our items, I'll place it when that text comes on screen. Uh, with new scans, I'll try and do it immediately when it says recoding to logbook and stuff like that. With that done, let's go. So here, what's happening is, in the game, I'm waiting to be healed. Um, because I'm standing in a safe zone, and as you can see by looking at the dot, my health is slowly recharging. And I want it to look roughly, roughly like I did um, there. So I kind of cut both sides of it there to make it a separate clip. Delete the commentary track in yellow, and on the video track, we go on speed and duration. And it tells you you can either set the speed as a percentage, or how long you want it to last. Let's try a thousand, what would that be? Five seconds? Eh, what about 1,200? Four seconds, 1,500. There we go, perfect. And what we want to do is also ripple edit shifting trailing clips. And basically what that means is when you do it, it'll bring everything else behind to kind of line up with it nicely. I've also said it's what's called frame blending, which is, so when stuff is moving quickly, you can either do frame sampling or frame blending. Frame sampling just takes, let's say it's going five times faster, it just takes every fifth frame and puts it together that way. What frame blending is doing is actually at every point it takes the average of all the frames at that point. So you can see here Samsung's arm cannon is smeared. So it gives a kind of motion blur effect which actually just makes it, to me, clearer that the footage you're viewing has been sped up. It's more slower to, to, it's more slower. It's slower to compute though so when Premiere Pro is rendering it, for example, it won't do... It, as in when it's rendering it as a preview like if I press play now. Well first I have to think about it for a fair bit and it won't do frame blending at all, it'll just do frame sampling. God, there's a really sinister wet. There we go. So that just sh still shows what's happening there and shows it quite clearly. But doesn't sit there. I don't want to I don't want to cut basically I use speeding up when I don't want to cut something, but I don't want to sit and watch it either. So, here is another separate visualizer element. These are marked in purple because this is Dark Temple Keys. So, here I need to do a transition where I bring up the map. Um, so, I tend to mark it. This one is marked in light blue. And we basically type in where we're going from and where we're going to, so I remember. So here we're going from the doomed entry to the dark oasis. I'll deal with this more a little bit later, but basically I drop now a placeholder to a sequence to allow myself to work with this more later. So I have this one called, where is it? Map frame, that's it. So you drag that over it, and map frame is basically, it's the frame that holds the map. So what you can see is that thing appears, it's a kind of, well, it's a separate sequence I bring to the side, and what happens in it is... That thing fades in, then spreads and opens up, and then reverses the whole thing. So, slapping map frame there. We'll put a map in there in due time, but what we actually want to do for now is... Cut out the section that I said we were going to cut out, which is there and there. Bring that over to here. And we basically want the transition between... There we go, that's... and that's probably when I want to start talking again, so I'll drag it so that my speech starts again there. And the important thing is, so that's when it opens, and we want the transition between the two streams of video to take place during the section which eventually you won't be able to see the video. This will make more sense when I actually come through to do the visualizer parts at the end. But we put it there, and what you see I'm doing there, that thing that says constant power, is cross-fading the audio. So what we'll see if we play the whole thing is this. From here, we now, if you bring up the map, we need to return to the Dark Oasis. Back here, I pointed this out last episode, we... So, that's kind of set the basis for this. As, as you can see, when I'm doing my first edit pass here, where I'm actually just 
attaching it all together. I'm basically just laying the groundwork, uh, and I'll come through on a second pass later on and do the visualizer. So, one of the things that comes up quite a lot as well is the transition from light to dark ether where this happens. If I'm talking through it, I leave it on, but as you can see on this section, I'm not talking through it, so make a cut when it fades to white there, and then when it fades to white there, make another cut, delete the section in the middle, crossfade the audio, trim out some, I think that's controller clicking there. No, it's me putting a beer down again. Um, let's trim that out, and then you'll see it'll run together quite smoothly. Yep, there we go. Let's head back to light ether. And I do that sometimes. I do it with loading screens or kind of cutscenes you see when you travel between areas and stuff like that. Just things where I can just save time without showing the same thing over and over again. I tend to do that. So here we have another map section. From here we are going from main reactor to the bio storage station. And so we'll bring the map frame down. And you kind of want it to... Uh, the last one I kind of I messed up a little bit because there's a lot of dead silence there. Here you can... What I want to do is have actually the majority of my talking as well being during the map to open time. So basically so that there isn't that long during which the map is up and nothing's going on. That, that way, while the map's doing its thing, I'm talking throughout it, which is very nice. That's only a shortcut as well. These are only relatively short transitions. Later on in the game, we end up needing to do much larger map cuts, but these ones are relatively small. So when does that start closing? It starts closing there. So once again, line up the audio. Oop, don't change the volume on it. Line up the audio. Bring those together. Crossfade. And there we go. Everyone's favorite location. You seem to have spent a disproportionate time there. Um, the bio storage station. So here are two new scans. Cool. On we go. views here. Number one is this thing. So, another new thing for the visualizer. I've actually not shown this at all so far. This is the first time we've come across it. But this is a beam ammo expansion, so I'm going to mark that in gold. I don't have pink. These are the only colors I've got access to, and I tend to use that one for dark keys, so that's the only other option, really. Got energy tanks, scans, dark keys, missiles, beam expansions, beginning and end of episode, items, and map. I'm very organized, I know. Thank you very much, and good day. So here we're at the end, and that's the point at which I want to end. So I slap a little marker here in white, being for the end of the episode, and mark it as N7. And I'll use that a little bit later on and bring it back there, actually. So, as you can see, this area now has been edited in a sense of I've cut it all together. But now we've got the visualizer work to do, and that's something a little more time-consuming. Well, yes and no. So, what we do in the first instance is, so you'll notice there's the track called Visualizer Frame, but it's both hidden, which is what that lack of eye means, and locked, which means nothing I can do can touch it. Now, we want to swap things around. Well, first I want to lock the audio track. You'll see why I just don't want to mess with it by accident. And lock. Are those two locked together? No, they're not. Cool. Wonderful. And lock the video track, just because I don't want to accidentally mess with that. Then we unlock the Visualizer track and turn it on. And you'll notice... The visualizer is here, overlaid. We don't want that, though. So let's go to our first scan. And what we do is delete the visualizer frame. Basically, as you can see from looking at the previous episodes, we actually only want the visualizer frame sequence to be there while the visualizer is active. So, but I have to leave it there for the whole time being anyway. Um, now, it's the first one. Uh, we'll do it twice. Sometimes if two scans are very close to each other, I tend to keep the visualizer up between them. But what we want to do here is divide it a little bit. So we skip forward 10 seconds and we make an incision there. We make an incision there as well. So we've got kind of a 10 second window there. 10 seconds is the time during which the visualizer appears, it does its thing, and then disappears. So we also need to make sure that it does disappear and, and reappear. So we then cut a second at the end of it and a second at the start of it. Now, what we want to happen is basically on these, we'll start with the actual video. So we'll turn the visualizer off. The video we want to kind of fade in while kind of suck in from the sides, stay there and then suck out again. And I have preset effects made for that. So 
footage in, footage mid hold, and footage out. And that means now what the video does is goes whoop, stays there for a while, and then goes whoop, back again. Very nice. We then also now want the um, visualizer to do the opposite. So the visualizer by default is already kind of in, so it doesn't need a middle one, it just needs viz in at the beginning, and viz out at the end. And getting rid of that, go over there, you can see it then goes foo whoop, and foo whoop. What will happen there will eventually will be the scan bar will move forward as well. I'm not going to do that yet. I'm actually just going to go forward and cut all of them with the appropriate time. So, next it's time for... Well, I haven't done all of those, but I've got... Eh, halfway through. I got to the first map visualizer, which is the point. So, time to do that. So, I make a sequence here that's named after... What episode is this? Is this seven? Yes, yeah, seven. The episode number and the map number following it. So, this is seven one. And what we need to do is make the map move correctly. Unfortunately, well... It's not going to work for a number of reasons, partly because this is light ether and this map needs to be in dark ether. Um, uh, where am I going from specifically? If I bring up the markers, tell me. I am going from the doomed entry to the dark oasis. Wonderful. So, turn that off for now. And we replace the map of light agon with the map of dark agon. Look at that. And now we basically, this thing needs to have a start point and an end point, which it already has here. The timings on this I've already worked out, it takes five seconds to move it quite nicely. So we need to work out firstly how much to move the map. In this case, we actually don't have to move the map at all, because this entry here is the part here is the doomed entry, and this part is the Dark Oasis. And both can be shown nice and easily on the same um, on the same zoom scale. So no movement needed there at all. We then just need to move the icon. So the icon moves on the same kind of time scale and it just represents me. So on at the first instance, we need to move it to the middle of the doomed entry. Then we need to make sure it finishes at the beginning of the Dark Oasis. It's just doing linear interpolation at the moment, so it just moves it like that. This doesn't actually work for obvious reasons. So what we need to do is add in some of our own time points. So at this point here, we want it to be we need to basically make sure it's actually lined up. This is maybe a bit more of a complicated one, isn't it? Um, let's say when we're here, gotta move it to the left, it's over there. Does that work? Oh, it's trying to do fancy things. Let's have less of that nonsense. There we go. It's trying to draw fancy lines, um, which I don't want it to do. Let's move that to there. How's that looking now? That's looking decent. So it curves around there. Oh, still a little bit. There, we want it to be more within the lines. That's looking decent. So, it goes there, curves around to there. Then we want it at this point to be... Oop, that's the wrong one, that's the one. At this point, we want it to be there-ish. And that should connect nicely. So, look at that. So then it goes whoop, 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 whoop. And doink, then we're done. It slightly goes over the edges a bit, but it doesn't matter that much. So, now we've gotten that, we then go back into the main editing area. And then, basically, we need to move one second forward. And then, slap our map on it. The map. What did I just do? Was it important? Overwrite. That sounds important. No, it wasn't important. Oh, I just didn't do the thing. Okay, cool. Delete that. And so, yes, so you'll notice the map thing opens up and then closes. And we need to get the our map underneath to do the same thing. And I've made a pre-made effect for that called Map Crop. Which, as you can see here, just is cropping on the edges of it. So now that should open up nicely. Then your dot moves from A to B. And then it closes. And you can see here, this is the transition point when the actual footage changes, but at that point it's covered by the map. And so how that ends up looking is like so. Bring up the map, we need to return to the Dark Oasis. Perfect. Yeah, at that point you can actually see the map is actually expanding slightly faster than the frame that holds it. 
And there again, it's not perfectly lined up with it. Which annoys me ever so slightly, but it's a grand total of a second that it's doing it for, so I play it at full to speed. To return to the Dark Oasis. No chance of you noticing. Wonderful. On we go. Got another map to do here. So this time we actually do need the map to move, because it can't, because we need to go from here to an area that's about here. So we started off up there, and then at the bottom, we then have it move to that point. And as you can see, the map moves like that. This makes lining up the icons sometimes a little bit harder, but I'll do my best. There we go. That looks like that works smoothly enough. Whee! Perfect. And then just like before, we just need to slap that at the correct point in here, which is there. And that should work very nicely. Back to everyone's favourite location. Oh, need to put the map crop effect on it, and that's it. Because that's what happens if you don't. Let's try that again. Ooh, everyone's favourite location. I seem to have spent a disproportionate time there. Um, the bio storage station. So, here are two new scans. Wonderful. Now we've got a new bit of visualizer here, so back onto that grindstone. Back to that grindstone. You don't really get onto a grindstone. That's not really how that phrase works. So, that's the first step done of the visualizer. Um, so all the map parts, as you can see, like here, are now done. These bits are all moving correctly. They just need to have the actual internal gubbins done on. So, if we go all the way back to the beginning of this episode... There we go. Now, so, let's bring up the second part of my spreadsheet over here. Which is some fun calculations. So, what we do here is, so this one is a scan. For all of them, we, the visualizer starts moving four seconds into its appearance. So it spends a second appearing, then it's there for three seconds before it then updates. So I drop a marker there, which then means I can go into the um, sequence itself, and add a keyframe, and then two seconds later, add another keyframe. So the visualizer takes a second to come in, waits for three seconds, then in two seconds the bar changes, or whatever element of the visualizer needs to change changes, and then it goes out during the final second. So here, what that means is it needs to go from, so it's currently at one of, so this is its kind of X coordinate here. If I move this, that's the bar moving around. And it needs to go from 107, which it's currently at, to 101, as you can see there. Uh, minus 101. There we go. The scan bar is a tiny little one that it just moves literally like six pixels at a time. But it gets there slowly. Um, all these calculations are based on, I positioned it at zero, positioned it at... 100% and I know how many scans that is and then they know it needs to move approximately six units each time. Here we then have another scan which means this needs to be three seconds forwards. Slap that down. You see how this is going now. Into here. Another keyframe. Two seconds later. A second keyframe and this time we go to minus 101. Minus 95. Now here, on this next one, this isn't a bar, this is the light beam has been acquired. So, that's a bit more of a difficult one. We still need to five, six, and eight, uh, position it the same thing, but instead of a bar moving, what needs to happen is that the light beam, which is here, needs to be unlocked. Which means I need to open up my visualizer guide. So if I go into here, visualizer, I guess this plan, pirate Photoshop. So here's the visualizer in all its glory, as you can see on the right here. There's a lot of stuff going on on it, but what we need is we need two things to happen. Firstly, we need the actual, so here are all your items on the left of the visualizer. We need the light beam to appear. So that's the light beam. If we, it's currently got a layer style on it, which basically covers it with black, darkens it. So if we get rid of that layer style, there you go, it appears. We also need, there's this light that connects all of the ones we've got so far. So we need to kind of make sure that appears. So to do that, we do a little stuff down here. Let's do it to... Ooh, why is that not flowing properly? 
Oh, it's because I'm wrong. Maximum hardness, I think. Uh, yeah. That's really weird. Hmm. Oh. The brush isn't on full opacity. There we go. So, we just need to line it up in that way. Wonderful. Um, and then we save that. There's nothing fancy that goes on with the visualizer. It, in terms of, so the bars move as part of Premiere Pro. The actual parts of the visualizer themselves, they don't move at all. They're just still images and it just moves between them. And whenever anything changes on it, I just fade into a new image. So if I go into live, then bring that back into Premiere, da da da, PG. And then at this point, replace it with the new one. You can see there, before and after, doink, it appears. And if we just dissolve it over, then it kind of goes, whoop, and fades in. And indeed, when I bring it back to here. And we have acquired the light beam. Yes, everything that's talking about dark and light energy is no Magical! Right, let's proceed. Just a couple more scans, so I'll do them on the speeder. Now here as well, we have a Dark Temple key, which is another one of the ones which updates slightly strangely, because again, it's, it's the same process as the last one, it's done by just updating this overall background thing. The Dark Temple key is over here, um, where are they under keys? Agon, turn on, Agon key number three. Easy enough. And let's put that again under live, so li live, the folder I call is just the finished elements of the background of the visualizer, which will then update as it goes along. And there we go, there's your third dark key. Cross dissolve it. Let's see how that looks. There's our third and final dark Agon Temple key. Wonderful. On with the show. I see that a lot, don't I? Now, this one here is Beam Ammo Expansion, which is actually not features on the visualizer at all yet, so that's, uh, 9, uh, 11, there we go. So, I need to actually bring this in. I've made it all, because it's all here in this, uh, Photoshop document, but I haven't actually imported it in yet. So, a couple of things need to happen here. Uh, we need to make room for it. All the various visualizer elements need to be behind the overall kind of screen here, otherwise they just extend off the side. And in order for the bars to move properly, um, they have to be behind it. So, I need to go into Visualizer Bars. That implies I've already imported it, which is good. Bars. There we go. So, we need to now bring in... Beam Bars. There we go. This nice purple one. And as you can see, it's purple at the top as well, so let's extend that all the way to the end of this Visualizer sequence. And we need to make sure it's positioned correctly. So at this point, it needs to have a keyframe, and it needs to be completely off the map. Fortunately, I've already done the calculations on it. So there are four beam upgrades in total, and here are the positions for them. So it needs to start at minus 611. Perfect. And then in two seconds, it needs to extend 25% of the way across to minus 298. Wonderful. Look at that. So that should then play quite nicely. A beam ammo expansion, so that's another type of thing for the visualizer. It's one of the three bars on the top there, I suppose. It's the topmost of the three bars. It's still the first night, I haven't actually blah 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 blah. Um, in case anyone noticed as well, these little indentations here are 10% each of them. So you can kind of, so that's 25%, you can gauge it there. We're actually, it's weirdly at this point, we're only on episode 7, but we've actually got nearly half the scan, so it is kind of non-linear in that sense. So this one here is an energy tank, which means it needs to go from minus 343 to minus 254 um, to move at the top. And as you can see there, whoop, lovely. And finally, this one here is a missile. There's a reason why I chose this episode to do the let's edit uh, 33 more 32, uh, because this has a bit of everything going on it, which is very nice. Uh, that makes it a good one to kind of demonstrate all the different aspects of the visualizer. So the missile bar, Needs to go from there, over the course of two seconds, goes to, right, it's on, minus 458, so it needs to go to minus 432. Minus 432. Wonderful. And does that look good? Missile expansion acquired. Yep, there we go. And I believe the next one is also a missile, isn't it? 
Oh, no, it's not. Oh, yes, the last one was an energy tank. And there we go. That is that is the end of it. So, that's the visualizer complete. One final thing to do now. We make a new sequence, which we call Echoes 7. Then, into this new sequence, we bring Echoes 1 frame, which is that complete thing with everything in it. So, as you can see, Echoes 1 frame is looking a little bit complicated. But that is seven episodes worth of cutting. What we want to do is, so the white ones markers are the ones that mark the start and end of an episode. Um, and that's why I put them as white, because they stick out really nicely for stuff like that. Then, the beginning of the episode, we fade in video, fade in the audio. Then, the end of the episode, where I've marked it, we slap my patented outro. It's not actually patented, don't steal it. And we just test that that all works. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. All good. And let's test the ending. From Dark Agon Temple and returning it over to... Okay, that's a little bit much. Let's go from there. Light side. Thank you very much and good day. That's a nice transition, actually. I really like that. So then that plays at the end. And you know how it all goes from there. So final thing to do is export media and we export it in h264 format because that's what youtube takes and it's also what my capture card records in it's all very handy even though it's all we've all edited it with the intro frame proxies which are slightly lower quality and then the final one premiere pro by default will never re render it with the um with those proxies it will always use the full quality versions to render it which is nice um just flicking through here just making sure everything all looks fine i don't know exactly what i'm looking for but if something was really badly long i'd like to think i'd see it badly wrong even i've got a number of presets here the one i use for this one is 720p60 because that's what it is um which is as you can see here 6 frames a second 1280 by 720 and it uses so this is your encoding. You've got either constant bitrate, variable bitrate one pass, or variable bitrate two pass. Variable bitrates is useful if you want to kind of, if you really kind of push for it. I know YouTube for 720p60 uses a constant bitrate of 7.5. There's no point in me trying to squeeze a file smaller than that because it doesn't really matter to me because I have gigantic hard drives now. I have my lovely new four terabyte drive, so I'm not exactly running out of space anytime soon. So, the full episode there is 25 minutes, which isn't bad. If we hit Q, then it loads it up in Adobe... what the fuck is it called? Media Encoder, that's it. Um, I'll shut some stuff down, can now... So, has it gone? There we go. Uh, I can close Photoshop. Close Chrome in the background as well, because that'll probably eat up some stuff. This is obviously where I've been recording sound. There we go. Wow, I've been doing this for an hour and 35. That's how long editing takes for a 25 minute episode. Interesting. Um, and now all we need to do is hit render. And there we go. As you can see, everything's completed. The render took about 20 minutes, so it's slightly, always slightly faster than real time, so it's a 24 minute video, um, which is always at least nice. And if we were then to go into complete... There you go, Echo 7. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Oop, hear me. You'll see why it's important to... And there it all is in its full glory. Complete with moving visualizers and whatnot. If I get some of the map sections as well. There's something going on there. Uh, there's a map around here, I think, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the whole process from start to finish. So if you watch the entire thing... Thank you. I'm impressed. And people have been asking this for a while, so I'm glad I finally did it. If people have got any questions or anything like that, I know I didn't go to particular detail of, like, how Premiere Pro works and stuff, stuff like that. I more just kind of just wanted to show what I do, not exactly how I do it. But if people have any questions in the comments, I'm I'm, I'm free to... I'm, I'm very much up for answering them. Um, I didn't go much into the creative process as well, like, how I actually, like, choose what games I'm going to do, how I'm going to kind of decide... Um, decide what the visualizer is going to look like, stuff like that. But again, I could get into that in a future video if people think it would be interesting. But yeah, thank you very much for watching. This has been Let's Edit Metroid Prime 2 Echoes. I think I might do another Let's Edit on how to do, I do kind of multicam multiplayer videos as well. But for now, thank you very much for watching. And well, if you haven't watched Metroid Prime, go watch it or watch some of my other stuff. It's all good. Thank you very much and good day.